I'm Jessica. I'm the clinical director at the Autism Treatment Center. Um, it was a perfect intro. So I have my background in um, school psychology and applied behavior analysis, working with individuals with challenging behavior. We'll be talking about that today um, broadly. Right now I'm working specifically with individuals who have autism, being at the Autism Treatment Center, and related disabilities, um, but primarily autism. So we'll be talking about that a little bit today too. All right. And we will have time for questions at the end. But um, if you have an absolutely burning question that you feel like it needs to happen at that moment, we have some time, so we can try being flexible in that way. Just raise your hand. All right. Autism is defined by two primary characteristics, and those are deficits in social and communication skills. Those are kind of linked, right? So, Communication is probably the most important type of social skill that we have. So that social deficit is the first piece. And the second piece is engagement in restricted, repetitive pattern of interests and behaviors. So you get these um, stereotyped, repetitive behaviors and social deficits involving communication to some extent. And those are the two primary defining features of autism. It's currently defined on a scale of one to three. So moving from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5, autism was defined as one category as opposed to having autism, PDD-NOS, and Asperger's as three separate um, categories. So levels one through three doesn't exactly map onto those previous areas that we had in the DSM-4. Level one is autism with these characteristic um, presentations that requires just minimal level of support in terms of achieving an independent level of functioning. Level two is a moderate level of support, and level three is needing substantial support in order to function in the way that that individual desires um, and to function in their community and in daily living skills. So those are three broad categories, but um, those are all within autism. Right now, it's one in 59 children are being diagnosed with autism in the United States. Um, I'm sorry, at large with CDC. And this is the fastest growing disability in the US, the developmental disability in the US, in terms of the numbers, right? So here it says it's more common than childhood cancer, diabetes, and HIV. So why is this, many people, that that's usually the main question on people's minds, is why is this, um, why is autism on the rise? Why is it increasing so rapidly? And um, so some of the things that people hear is, um, you know, maybe it's something in the environment, maybe it's just that we understand it better than we used to, and so we're catching it more often. Um, maybe it's vaccines. Um, there are all of these different explanations. By and large, the research suggests that, or supports that it is, that we understand it much better and we're talking about it differently than we ever have before. We know there have been huge changes in the diagnostic criteria over the years with defining autism. So by and large, roughly, you know, 90%, let's say, of the increase is related to that. It does seem that there is some true increase. There's some evidence to suggest that um, that change of diagnostic criteria alone doesn't account for this rate of change that we've seen in this amount of time. So a small percentage of that change may be related to something, um, a true increase over time. And why that is, we're not sure. Uh, the area that has had the most research in it is vaccines, because there has been a lot of um, interest in society and speculation about vaccines contributing to the rate of autism. There's been the most research in that area, and um, the research unanimously supports that um, by the scientific community that vaccines are not associated with an increased risk for autism. Um, granted, there, that correlation between the time when vaccines happen and when autism begins to show, when individuals begin to show signs of autism, there is a correlation there, but um, no, no causal link. But um, so some, the most, um, the most recent research that is most promising actually looks at some autoimmune activity in utero in the mother that may be related to an environmental increased risk for autism in genetically 
predisposed individuals. Boys are four to five times more likely than girls to be diagnosed with autism. Now why is that? Um, by and large, boys are more at risk for various kinds of developmental disabilities. Um, some of that may be a true increased risk. Boys tend to be more vulnerable um, in utero as they're developing. But also, um, we understand, we look for externalizing symptoms, right? We all know about that for all different kinds of disorders. Those are the kinds of symptoms that tend to catch our attention and tend to get diagnosed. And so there may be some of that going on. Some of the, um, the difficulties that we see with autism are more um, externalized, maybe related to the way that um, society kind of shapes behavior in boys. And therefore, boys um, are catching attention more often of professionals getting diagnoses more often. We also, um, the way that we're defining it right now, maybe that's more how it presents in boys. Maybe we don't have a complete understanding of how autism presents in girls. So one in 59 children at large diagnosed with autism. In individuals who have a sibling diagnosed with autism, it's one in five. So huge increase, right, in terms of risk. Um, there's a lot of research happening right now surrounding baby sibs is what they're called. So siblings of um, individuals with autism and getting intervention right away just based on that risk factor that, they're, that they have a sibling who's diagnosed with autism. And so um, in monozygotic twin concordance rate, 70 to 85 percent of monozygotic identical twins um, will, have, will both have autism or both not have autism, right? Um, so clearly what we know most is that there is a huge genetic component to autism. But um, we would expect that to be 100 percent, right, if it was purely genetic, if it was something that was just written into our genome and preset genetically. So the question is, okay, so if it's environmental, we're still talking about, and um, we're still talking about an identical, we would think, in utero environment for monozygotic twins. But there's probably slight differences in things like um, the kinds of like exposure that one um, fetus might be getting relative to the other, different rates of blood flow, different rates of oxygenation, things like that. Sometimes um, there's differential nutrients being passed to one of the two fetuses. So those kinds of earliest environmental influences probably play a role. Okay, now we're getting to the crux. That's kind of autism um, as an overview, sort of the medical model of autism, but still answering those big questions that people typically have whenever we're talking about autism. So now, um, the core of this presentation of our um, symposium today is about challenging behavior that we tend to see in autism. So I didn't say that challenging behavior is one component of autism. I said that autism is related to communication and social deficits and restricted repetitive pattern of interest and behaviors. So think about those, um, those core symptoms and how that might predispose an individual to developing behavior problems. And um, challenging behavior, there, that there's different terms, people have different preferences for challenging behavior versus problem behavior, those kinds of um, maybe euphemisms, what do we call it, right? But here, essentially, we're talking about behavior that interferes with an abilities, a person's ability to learn and function and develop new skills. We're talking about aggression, self-injury, property destruction, so, um, you know, aggression, we're talking hitting, kicking other people, biting, um, self-injury, maybe doing those things to yourself. Um, so we've, I've worked with individuals who are pulling their own hair even. So those kinds of things that are presenting injury to themselves. Um, destruction of property, pica, ingesting inedible objects, elopement, um, running away from caregivers or running away from a particular environment um, where they're supposed to be and non-compliance, screaming, crying. And these aren't presented in any particular order. But take a minute to think about which of these maybe present the biggest risk to individuals um, who are having challenging behavior. So self-injury is um, one particular area that can be extremely challenging, right? But there's so many different levels of it and functions, reasons for it, which is what we'll be talking about. 
But pica and elopement are huge um, health and safety risks. These are the, the kinds of things that really scare parents, right? When your child could be running out into traffic at any given moment or um, could ingest something that could be life-threatening. But then again, self-injury, destruction, those kinds of things can be life-threatening as well. So challenging behavior, it could just be interfering with their ability to learn in a classroom to the point where any particular instance of it could be life-threatening. Worked with individuals who um, have self-injury that involves dislocating their retina um, and making themselves blind even. And individuals who maybe just kind of hit their elbow on the table and over time they develop some mild bruising or even redness. But all of that could be considered self-injury. So ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, is an approach to understanding learning and development. It's not any particular set of procedures, um, but it's a framework by which we understand learning and development. And it is the approach that is most evidence-based for working with individuals with challenging behavior and autism, that particular combination, but also skill development in autism. And I think a, a lot of this has to do with um, ABA uses data, right? Everything is database decision making. Everything is um, operationalized. We're defining things in terms of very, very clear criteria and measuring improvement or progress every step of the way. So there's a lot of evidence for everything that we do in ABA. And that evidence has resulted in widespread support in the medical and scientific communities of ABA for treating these kinds of behaviors. And the essence of ABA's approach to challenging behavior is this. Challenging behavior, it's not a symptom directly of autism. It's not, um, it's not something that is bound to happen because of this person's disability, but rather because of their communication difficulties. And therefore, we're using challenging behavior as a form of communication. Okay? So it's looking for the message in the behavior that we're seeing. And so um, we're determining why, right? What is, why is this behavior occurring? And why is it continuing to occur over time? So, you know, why is this happening? That's a question everybody asks, right? But why is it continuing to occur over time? That's where you're really looking at particular environmental variables, things in that person's environment that might be contributing to the maintenance of this behavior over time. And we're doing that by looking at this ABC three-term contingency. We're looking at the antecedents, what happens right before a behavior, the behavior itself, and what follows the behavior. Now, ironically maybe, this ABC three-term contingency is sometimes, I think, what um, makes ABA look overly simplistic. And so sometimes this can even give people a bad rep, or can even give ABA kind of a bad rep. Okay, yeah, we're looking at what happens before a behavior, we're looking at the environment, what's the big deal, ABC. Well, in the day-to-day, -day, there are hundreds, thousands maybe, overlapping antecedents at any given moment, right, that are influencing your behavior. And there are all different kinds of consequences that are happening too. And so if you're in the classroom with your student or you're at home with your child, life is happening all around you all the time and it's extremely dynamic. And it is really hard to tease this apart. If we could, yeah, we'd all be you know, expert behavior analysts and it'd be really easy and we could change behavior all the time, but it's not easy. And even expert behavior analysts have toddlers <laughs> and sometimes it's really hard to figure out the ABCs surrounding that toddler's behavior when it's in the day to day. So we have tools that we use to get at this in a, um, in a very evidence-based, a very discreet and um, kind of microscopic way. So when I think microscopic, I think about that detective, right? A detective looks at uh, the relationships on a large scale level, but it also looks, a detective looks for little cues or clues in the environment um, that might be missed by someone who doesn't have that trained eye. And that's what we're trying to do with ABA, is look on that, that microscopic level of what might be creating and maintaining things over time. So we're not talking about what the behavior looks like necessarily. 
but why it's happening. And um, that's what function-based interventions are all about. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. And that sounds common sense, but what really happens um, in society is that we tend to talk about behavior more in terms of um, topographical classes or what it looks like. So toddlers hit, there's whole books um, written and sold on why toddlers hit. <laughs> and it's all about because, you know, maybe the theory is toddlers, um, they want to touch you and they, they want physical interaction, but they don't know how to get that physical interaction, so they use too much force. So instead, what you should do is you should teach your toddler to hug you instead of hitting you, or they sh you should teach them um, to do nice touches. And so that works some of the time, definitely. But to assume that all toddler hitting happens because they want your physical attention um, is grossly misinformed. Because it's not getting at the why. It's not saying that, that hitting is communicating some, anything on an individual level. It's saying, this is what hitting means. And ABA uses a different approach than that. So burping. People have a tendency to assume maybe that's attention seeking. But it could also be physiological, right? It could be GERD. Um, or maybe they assume it's GERD, but maybe it's attention seeking. It could be any of these things. Self injurious, um, self -injurious behavior that's so intense that it leaves um, calluses and scars and like, you know, thick scar tissue on someone's skin. Ashley's going to be sharing a case with you that fits kind of that description. And um, even in an ABA clinic, when he first came to us, people assumed, even ABA experts, that this must be an automatically maintained behavior. This must be a behavior that is reinforcing in and of itself. Um, he's responding to something in his body and we have no control over it. Because how could anybody engage in this severe behavior if it's just to get attention or if it's just to get out of work? Surely they'd find some way to do that other than biting themselves to the point of um, serious injury. But that's not the case. <laughs> you can have literally every topography of behavior can occur for a different function. It depends on the individual. Arm flapping, people tend to assume that this is reinforcing in and of itself. Often it is, but not always, right? You might um, do it at first because it feels good or because you're excited, but then what if you get a response from your parent or um, from friends that's reinforcing in some way? Um, maybe you're hanging out by yourself and you're playing with your toys and you, you flap a little bit because you get excited or you're imitating something you saw and then your parents rush over because they're very concerned that you look autistic in that moment. I don't know. And you get a lot of attention for it, right? Then maybe you could actually be engaging in it because of the attention you get. That's what I mean by what starts a behavior, the antecedent, doesn't necessarily tell you anything about what's maintaining it over time. Um, disrobing, another example that Ashley's going to be talking with you about with um, a case in a little bit. People tend to assume that they do that, that individuals do that because it feels good, maybe. You take off clothes because why would you wear clothes if you didn't have to? <laughs> um, but not necessarily. And even crying. I, was, uh, I, I work with um, individuals 0 to 22 right now. And I was in the infant toddler clinic the other day, and we have this little toddler who um, has this particular cry when you take away her toy, you know, and it's, it just, it's heart-wrenching to me. Every time I hear it, I'm like, I want to rush over and pick her up and comfort her because it sounds so emotional. But then as soon as you give her her toy back, no more crying. There's no carryover. It really is functional. It's social. It's to get something from her environment because she doesn't have any words. But it sounds very emotional. And not that those two things are always separate, but um, you can't really just assume. Right? You have to kind of do an assessment and look at it very closely.